Hi, I wanted to share my experiences with the Waze LV1. For those of you that may be curious about the platform, or maybe you're already using the LV1 and you just wanted to see some other uh, perspectives on how to use the system. So I'm gonna go through uh, each element of my system piece by piece and explain why I've made the choices I have. So I wanted to start by talking about where my interest in the LV1 comes from. Uh, in my professional life, I do three main things. I do live sound, I do recording, and I teach. Um, I do teach audio production at the college level. Uh, so on any given day, uh, I could be at a corporate events, I could be um, running live sound for uh, a concert, I could be in a classroom, I could be doing a location recording, I could be doing a studio recording, I could be doing any number of things. Um, and a couple years ago, I realized that it was very frustrating that I had a different set of tools everywhere I went. Um, I would have this console's EQ here and then this console's EQ here. And I never really felt like I was intimately learning anything. So um, to be able to take the Waves plugins and send them back to the cloud and then pull them down into uh, the studio session or into a multi-rack um, application to use with a third-party console or to pull into the LV1, it's really been beneficial to me um, because I use the exact same tools all day, every day. And uh, anything I learn in one situation can start applying to the other. So it really has, I believe, upped the level of my work. Uh, it's given me better results uh, because I'm very, very familiar with, with how everything works. And I don't think that that's something that is uh, talked about enough, um, that it's really beneficial, I think, to an engineer that you have now have the ability to use your same tools everywhere and really know them uh, better than you might have. Okay, so I'm gonna go through my rig piece by piece and explain why I made the choices I did. So uh, behind the computer, which you can't really see from the angle that I have, um, is the Netgear 16 port rack mountable switch that Waves uh, approves on their website. I don't remember the model number, but it's easy to look up. Uh, I wanted this for two reasons. Um, first off, I wanted it to be rack mountable because I tend to reorganize my rig regularly depending on uh, the purpose I need it for. The other important part is that I drilled a hole in one of the rack gears to put an Ethercon connection. So when I do run a gig and I need to run Ethercon to the stage, I have that port showing up uh, at front of house um, rather than having to have a bunch of adapters. So I really liked the ability for that. Behind that, you can also see to the sides, this is my RTA mic, which is on a gooseneck. It's real easy to pull it in and out when I need it. Uh, my talkback is on the other side. It's, uh, it's a cheap switched mic that I got at a used music store. And yeah, it serves the purpose for being a talkback. It doesn't have to be a anything super important. Now, um, I decided to run with a Microsoft Surface 3 as my uh, main CPU. Um, the Surface 3, I know that there are many versions past this now, but this is plenty powerful to run the LV1. Uh, most of the audio, well, all the audio processing is happening in the server, so all this really has to do is run the app. Um, this one's been totally fine and stable for me. Um, I like that it's small and accessible. Um, it's really easy at the end of the gig to just snap this off and throw out my backpack, and let's say that I'm on a plane or um, riding in the back seat on the way to a gig, I can just pull this out and make a change without having to set up a whole computer. It's really, really useful. Um, the other thing is that I, I personally am not a big fan of uh, touchscreen uh, mixing. Um, I just really would rather have physical faders, uh, but I still wanted the flexibility of having a touchscreen, so the Surface does both. It's the computer and it's the touchscreen too. So I still have that option to control things here. So moving down from that, I have a Behringer X-Touch as my physical faders as a control surface. I do a couple gigs where I will run sound all day and then I'll have to go and make rough mixes in the evening. It's really easy to pull this out of the rig and then um, I basically just have a little studio session in the hotel and then I can bring it back and we're all good to go. 
Uh, beyond that, I literally just went up to the local computer store and I bought the smallest, cheapest keyboard I could find. Uh, and then I used an old trackball. These are all stuck to the rack with gaff tape. Um, they're on there really solidly, um, but they more than serve the, serve the purpose. So um, I really uh, like the option to be able to do something with the touchscreen or with the control surface or even, or even just mouse it in if, if it's what I feel I'm, I'm quickest at. Um, it's compact, it's flexible, I'm really happy with this. Okay, so let's move down the rig to the 8-space rack that I have underneath. So um, you're going to notice a couple things here. I have a Furman line regulator. So in addition to preventing uh, damage from surges, it also verifies that I'm always getting a steady 120 volts out of the power supply. Below that, I have a vent because uh, these interfaces tend to run pretty hot, so I need some ventilation. And then you end up getting down to my two interfaces. Now, um, I've chosen to put my interfaces at front of house for a couple reasons. Uh, the first reason is simply uh, that it's one less case for me to carry from the trailer to the stage. Uh, so it's one less thing to load in and one less thing to pack up at the end of the night. But more importantly, it protects it from the elements. Um, I work on a lot of stages that are open on the sides and it's real easy for the rain to get into them um, if, you have, uh, if you have a pop-up rainstorm. With my interfaces back here, um, I tend to work under a 10 by 10 pop-up tent. So if we have a pop-up rainstorm, I can drop the legs on the tents, protect the rack, easily get the, uh, the covers on the uh, case, and then get it, to the, uh, get it back to the trailer or the, or the, or the truck safely. So it's just a peace of mind for me that, it, that it's there. So um, first I chose a DigiGrid IOX, 12 inputs, six outputs. I got this for a number of reasons. Um, First off, a lot of the shows I do tend to be with smaller acts, so 12 channels is many times um, plenty, in which case I can pull the iOS out and use it elsewhere. Um, the other reason is that um, during the winter months, I do a lot of classical recording. I do a lot of concert recording for orchestras and small uh, chamber ensembles. Uh, I've done some CD recordings and some things like that. That interface does not have a server in it, so it doesn't have a fan in it, so it doesn't make any noise. So it's really great for me to just be able to pull the IOX out, go somewhere with my laptop, and have a completely silent rig where I don't have to worry about any extraneous noise, and I can sit in the room with the performers and, and get, a, uh, get a good recording. Um, I find the mic pre's to be very detailed and clean, and I think they work great for that. Below that, I have a DigiGrid iOS, and I chose the iOS for a couple reasons. Um, the analog snake that I use uh, only really has 20 channels available to it, so 12 plus 8 makes my 20. Um, the other thing about it is that since there is a server inside of it, um, sometimes I will pull the iOS out of the rig, drop it in a small rack, and take that along with my laptop to corporate gigs where I'm only dealing with um, probably a pair of podium mics, maybe a lavalier mic or two, and maybe some handhelds. So eight channels is plenty for that, um, but it allows me to use the LV-1 and all the plugins, uh, even for something small and simple like that. The other thing I like about having a server in here is that if my server one, which is on the bottom here, ever did die on me on a gig, um, I would be able to strip back my uh, plugins in the LV-1 and simply run the rest of the show using the uh, server that's in the iOS. It's not as powerful, but it would be, I'd be able to at least get something going to make my way to the end of the show. So it's a peace of mind that I actually have a second server. So next in line, I have a DBX386, which I got used off of Reverb really cheap. Uh, it has a digital SPDIF output, and it's going into the SPDIF input on the iOS. Uh, I use that primarily for my RTA and um, talkback mics, um, but if I really needed to, I could press them into service to give me a total of 22 inputs. Uh, and as I said before, my server one is the last thing below that. Last but not least, I have a 24 by 4 analog snake um, that is obviously connected to the interfaces. Um, I've put turnarounds on channels 21 through 24 
and I use those in addition to A, B, C, and D. Um, on the bottom here, it gives me eight potential outputs. Uh, that gives me up to five monitors, as well as uh, my main left and right and my sub output. I like to use OxFed subs most of the time. Of course, I, I've got more adapters and I can make more changes if I really needed more outputs. Uh, but in general, uh, I, I tend to be fine with uh, these four outputs. Um, the 20 inputs are connected directly into the interfaces. And all I have to do is pull this out to the stage and then at the end of the show, coil it back up, put it in, and the whole thing just goes back in the trailer. So to supplement my console, I actually bring a Pelican case with an XWSG card. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, a lot of bands these days use X32s for their in-ears. So this is uh, really flexible and it's a great thing to add to my rig. Um, so in here I have the card. Uh, it's still in its anti-static bag to be safe. I have a switch, uh, one of the Netgear GS108s, which is approved by Waves. I have a pair of uh, Cat6 cables to make the connections, the power supply for the GS108, and then a uh, connector here that goes from Ethercon to uh, Cat6 so that I can get from the snake to the uh, to the switch easily. A friend of mine also has the Midas DL251, so there have been occasions where I've used that, which gives me another uh, 32 uh, high-quality mic pre's in addition to mine to give me a grand total of 52 potential inputs. Really flexible, sounds really great, uh, works out um, really well, and this has been a great investment. So that's my LV-1. I hope you found this informative or at least entertaining. And if you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, feel free to leave them below in the comment section. Uh, I hope some other LV-1 users do the same and we can share some ideas and really uh, make for a robust community. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. <laughs>